Good evening, and it's wonderful to join together with you again tonight. And first of all, if any of you are watching from the East Coast, be assured that our prayers have been and are with you at this time of the hurricane. Um, and if those would be with us tonight and are not, uh, make sure that all of us are vessels through which the Holy Spirit upholds them and strengthens them at this time. And also let me say one more time that in two days, that's this coming Thursday, if you're within the San Antonio area or know someone that might be interested, we are going to begin meeting on a Thursday night in Northwest San Antonio, all details on our webpage, for a time of fellowship and prayer and praise and some teaching. Um, that there's a longing inside of us to be with a company of believers who are of like mind or a company who are seeking what we're talking about and so that's the reason for it okay uh, I, I saw some of your postings there of how much you were looking forward to tonight uh, the title well I have changed what I was going to say and so what was going to be tonight's message will come another time I want to give something which I believe is what the Lord would have for us tonight and it, it's something I don't think I'll ever get away from I I have been looking at this and I have I, I've spoken on it so many times from so many different angles it is the very heart I believe of the covenant blessing and it's ours and that's where I want to look at so um, we could go more than one place but in 2nd Thessalonians and chapter 3 and verse 16 now said Paul now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way uh, that I'm not talking about that but <laughs> it, it's it's a tremendous blessing that he is declaring over these people now may the Lord of peace and that word is in the Old Testament Shalom which which covers the deepest heart core peace regardless of what is going on around you and may this Lord of peace the source of all peace himself not not through mediating angels or something the very Lord of Shalom himself give you Shalom peace always that would be enough but he goes on in every way now with that in mind he follows up with the statement the Lord be with you all and that's that's the phrase in fact um, it wouldn't surprise me if some of you have heard me talk about this before because it is as I say it permeates the scripture it is the heart of the covenant and it brings with it all the salvation that is in Jesus Christ and yet I find it an inexhaustible well and I believe this is what the Lord would share with us tonight the Lord be with you all now Paul is writing this way into the New Testament and yet this has been a greeting or a blessing of one covenant person to another since almost the very beginning of the Bible it, it's as if the Lord himself gave this as a blessing in our mouths to give one to another or as it was in Old Testament days and went on through the New Testament and in some areas right to this very day where it was a greeting it was the way we so absently meaninglessly say hello or 
Uh, usually, of course, we turn all attention to ourselves and say, how are you doing? Report on your happenings, which uh, usually that puts us down. And especially if you are down and somebody says, how are you doing? There's a terrible sense of loneliness, isn't there? Because you know they really do not give a fig how you are. They're simply saying something without meaning. And, and if ever you did tell them how you are, they'd probably run away. Uh, what, what's the, the other thing they say? What's up? What's up, you say? Or how's it going? Always the, the, the question of greeting is evoking a report on the happenings in your life. It, it gives all attention to the happenings and your feelings about those happenings. And of course, those feelings about the happenings are merely a flesh evaluation of what's going on. So they're perfectly useless. But this is the greeting, the way as far back in the Old Testament, and you can actually read it happening in the book of Ruth, uh, where the, the Lord of Bethlehem, the man who owned all the fields around Bethlehem, and he comes into the field and all his workers so here you have no class distinction this man comes in and his greeting to the people is the Lord be with you and all the people chorus back that the blessing of the Lord be with you too or they might have said and also with you it was the way they greeted and it crossed all barriers and lines uh, if you met anyone on the street, that would be your first declaration. The Lord be with you. And so whether you were a housewife or an attorney, a plumber, electrician, whether you're a rancher or a student, to meet each other, recognizing that the person you are meeting is a covenant person, you would declare to them Notice that you would declare, you would in fact call a blessing upon them. You would point out to them in case they'd forgotten in this greeting, not hello, not how are you doing, but declare to them, the Lord be with you. And they would be awakened to say, yes, and the Lord bless you or and with you also. Um, and so greeting meant that somebody declared to you or pointed out to you or caused you to remember your belovedness, your uniqueness, that you are the one that God himself, the Lord, is with you, with you. And... and notice and it's a rather awkward thing in English the Lord be with you um, I, I suppose you could to, to, to almost say the Lord bees with you it's it's somehow stronger in its ancient form than just to say the Lord is with you the Lord be with you a and that is absolute present tense now the Lord be with you. And so you are declaring that the Lord is in this moment in which I meet you. In this, just a, a breath on the click of the clock, here I declare He is with you. We're not saying He was once, nor are we saying we'll get it right one day and He'll be with us. But however I find you, whatever situation I find you in, whatever challenge you're facing, whatever opportunity fills your horizon, be assured I speak my greeting, the word of the Lord to you. The Lord be with you now. That, that's, that's the whole point. And if you read back through the Old Testament, you will come across this phrase in, in one form or another. Quite often it's just this phrase. Sometimes it's a little different, but you can immediately hear this phrase in it. And when persons were in deep 
distress as far as what was happening to them in this now moment, they would respond to this now moment in terms of this blessing which they would assure themselves. And so do you remember Joseph? Joseph was um, one of the most abused of characters in the Old Testament. I mean, his own brothers uh, kidnapped him and then uh, falsified his death, making it look as if he'd been attacked by a wild animal, presenting bloody clothes to his doting father. They sold him into slavery. The person who purchased him, uh, uh, his wife, then blackmails him, and he's thrown into jail, you remember. And in jail, even those who he sought to help forgot all about him. And yet, if you read that story in the second half of Genesis, the whole story, and it's obviously written by Joseph. It's too personal for anyone else to have written it. He's writing from the inside. And all the way through his story, he injects this. And the Lord was with Joseph. And at the time when he injects that phrase, one, naturally speaking, would stand back and say, incredible. I mean, the man has been kidnapped, sold as a slave, and now he is a slave and has a master. And he lives down in the slave huts. And he writes in his journal, and the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with him. Incredible, incredible. And, and then as he's in jail, the Lord was with Joseph. And of course, the end of the story, he, he is exalted to be second ruler in the world. The Lord was with him. But in its darkest hour, this was the phrase. There was no one to say it to him, but he declared it into the darkness. The Lord was with Joseph. And in, in past weeks, when we were looking at David, you remember when he was being pursued by Absalom and he looks into the future at, at what could happen, what might happen, the, even if this happens, and he wrote in Psalm 23, do you remember? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. But he was lifting that from this phrase. Because this phrase that we're speaking of tonight, the Lord be with you. David again in that intense loneliness and darkness had no one to say it to him, but he lifted it and made it part of his declaration of faith as he psalms his God the shepherd. And he said, though I walk through this intense darkness, though I am pursued for death by my own son, I will fear no evil. What's the foundation of your no fear, David? Are you just whistling in the dark? No. I fear no evil, for you are with me. You are with me. And... and I, I, I might point out again, and I, I, I guess I have to do this, because all of our greetings in the West here, um, they're quite meaningless, you see. It, I mean, even when, when people would say, have a good day, my, my best idea is I'm glad they didn't say have a bad day, but really and truly they have no power in their words. And it's a meaningless expression. It rolls off their lips and they forget they say it before they finish saying it. And, and when we read this, how many times, I, I just, and I don't know, but at the end of the epistles, like this one, um, there, there are these, like, if I were to read on to the end of um, where we're at, 2 Thessalonians 3, 16 at the end in verse 18 he says and the grace of our lord jesus christ be with you all well i, I wonder I, I do honestly wonder when because that appears at the end of many 
of the epistles, as do the greetings at the beginning. And I, I wonder, do we really believe that they not only meant it, but the Holy Spirit was in those words? It, it's not just signing off. It's not saying, well, folk, Roger, over and out. Um, I've said my bit, and that's it. No, the, these words, the Lord be with you all, and all the similar words, they are not to be taken just as, well, he was saying goodbye, or he was saying hello. No. You see, even when we greet each other, in our understanding of the gospel, our words of greeting contain power. This is a statement of reality. This is a statement of absolute truth. And it was done as a greeting in order to awaken people to the truth. I mean, can, can you imagine this as you're on your way to work uh, and you're not fully awake and the first person you meet and the Lord be with you. And you would begin your waking up now, or if you'd forgotten overnight, you're, you're waking up to the realization as you go to your place of employment, you are going in this relationship with the Lord that is called with. The Lord be with you. And, and as I sit at my desk, as I go into my cornfields, as I tend my cattle, as I go into the factory, I am going because I've met 10 people out there and they all greeted me with the Lord be with you. And so by the time I get to work, it's rising within me that I am doing my work. I am relating to people all in this relationship of withness with God, with. And so this, this very strength is not some sort of um, religious daydreaming it's it's arresting the day it, it is punching what I perceive in terms of happenings I punch it in the face with and the Lord is with me and, and then I meet others and assure them and the Lord is with you you see that, that's it's it, it's inner strength this is for real it's for real you can greet yourself as you swing your legs out of bed and say, the Lord is with me. It's for real. And the very statement and the truth that it brings, brings inner strength and that the radiance of him who fills our lives. I've been saying this relationship that is called with, I use that term carefully because it's a lot more than what the word has come to mean. You know, um, in English, many of our words have been so devalued um, that they mean nothing. Um, so, you know, you're, you're with somebody. It sort of means you're vaguely in their company. But this word with, if we investigated early English, but certainly when we get to the Hebrew meaning of the word, it is a potent word. And I say again, it's a covenant word. And I say again, it defines a relationship. The Hebrew word, I'll give it to you, with, the word with in Hebrew is im, I am, im. And what does im mean? Well, I, I'll, I'll spin it out so you really get the picture. It means to accompany someone through life. So right there, it isn't speaking of, of someone you happen to sit next to uh, in the diner. Uh, no, no, this is already you're, you're hearing the idea of commitment, a uh, witness that is not casually taken on. Because if you are with someone, the word means that you will accompany them through life, which means through every experience, through all the journeys. Actually, it is related to our marriage ceremony, 
which is very ancient and picks up many of these ideas from the covenants of the scripture. And so in our marriage ceremony, we say, for better or for worse, for rich or for poor, in sickness and in health. What that religious ceremony, a beautiful ceremony, is seeking to say is this Hebrew word with. The, the, the bride and the groom are taking covenant oath to be with each other. But we need to spell it out, and so we do so in those words. That in every experience of life, through every valley and every mountaintop, through every storm, every hurt, every laughter, every joy, we accompany, we shall beside each other. That's the meaning, beside each other, accompanying each other in every experience. And the word with has the meaning and idea of motion toward, motion toward. Um, so close togetherness. So accompany, yes, that's a good meaning of the word if you get the idea of commitment. Alongside, beside, yes. But let's push it even further, because this word with means a close togetherness. It is speaking of relationship. It is speaking of covenant loyal friendship. So you're living now, you're living in company with another in a relationship that is bonded with blood and it is true and will never fail. You're living in company. You're sharing together a common life. And even as you're sharing common experiences, you're participating together in the same life. It's covenant relationship, right? Covenant relationship. Now, that that's what the word means but there are places where it is used in the scripture that push it even further to a relationship that is uh, well it's spoken of later on in the scripture of I Jesus saying I in you and you in me that's with but in John chapter 1 verse 1 where it's speaking of Jesus as the a Son of God, God the Son, in his relationship with God the Father. Do you remember? And maybe you just slid over it, but now when you hear this word, you'll, you'll hear it. In the beginning was the Word, that is Jesus, the Son of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God and the word was God. Did you hear that? The relationship between God the Son and God the Father is described by the word with. And many theologians ha have described that word in the Greek language with the echoes of the Hebrew as meaning face to face or even cheek to cheek, a closeness, a belovedness, a oneness. And in fact, in verse 18 of John chapter 1, where he's still talking about this relationship, he says, speaking of Jesus, that he is the only begotten God or God from God who is in the bosom of the Father, which describes a little baby crushed in the arms of love, in the bosom of. You realize this word with is an enormous word in the scripture that takes us to this covenant relationship of being one with. And especially in in the end of John and also in Ephesians in chapter 1 it, it, it goes into this as this is the heart of what a Christian is this is what it means to have believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ 
um, Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, you could read pretty much the whole chapter and catch the mood of, of Paul as he's exploding, as it was exploding. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And goes on to say, all that is so now concerning us, you and me, right now. And one word there he says that, that he would have us before him in love. And that word before him doesn't just mean standing before him, but it's, it means this word with. It means that you, because you, you, please hear me, you have been included into Jesus and you are now, dare I say it, brought cheek to cheek with God the Father through God the Son, Lord Jesus Christ, made a reality to us by the Holy Spirit. And if you think, that, that's a bit much, then listen to what Jesus said himself. And you can read all the way from John chapter 13 to John chapter 17, that entire episode in the upper room. And there, uh, this is repeated in many different ways. Uh, the, the great text, which of course um, we, we have sold down the river really to funeral directors where, where Jesus said I go to prepare a place for you um, in my father's house are many dwelling places or abiding places and I will come again so that where I am there you may be also where I am there you may be also and, and of course people have said that's when you go off to heaven and get a golden mansion or something but um, if you read the whole context, Jesus was saying, I go to prepare a place for you. Where, where did he go? He was sitting in the upper room when he said that. Where did he go? He went from that seat in the upper room to his sufferings and death and bloodshedding and his resurrection and his ascension. It was a direct line from saying this, I go to prepare a place. He went to prepare a place on the cross, in the grave, in his resurrection and in his ascension. And what did he prepare? He said a dwelling or the word is used all the way through John chapter 14 and 15, only they've translated it as abide, an abiding. Only in this one verse, they turned it into something like a house. No, it's saying that we would live inside of. So he said, in my father's house, in that immediate presence of my father, there's room for everybody. There's many, many abiding places. And I go to prepare one for you in order that where I am with my Father, so you may be also with my Father because you're with in me. Do, do you get this? I wish I could see your eyes. John chapter 15, where he uses that same word, only and now it's translated, if you abide in me, and I abide if you live in me. And then he talks about the relationship there of a branch to the vine. I mean, pick any tree, the branch and its relationship to the, the trunk of the tree, it's one. And the sap that comes up through the trunk of the tree goes into the branch and the fruits and so on. Well, that's what he meant when he said, I am in you and you are in me. It's, it's an organic relationship. It's with. That's with, you see. The Lord be with you. You're one together. You accompany each other. His life is your life. Your life is his life. Where you are, he is. Where he is, you are. That's, that's with. And then, I think it's chapter 16, he goes to the limit. And he says the Holy Spirit will come and he will abide in you but then he said and the father and he Jesus 
we, he says, we will come and make our abode or abiding place with you. C can you fathom this? That as we sit in this virtual room, we are sitting inside of the Holy Trinity, embraced by divine triune love, and He, by the Holy Spirit, lives inside of us. Do, do you, I, I trust the Holy Spirit will cause you to realize this incredible fact this is so i greet you indeed and say the lord the father son and holy spirit be with you you see this was the plan from the very beginning uh, right there in genesis chapter one have you noticed that the first um, words of scripture is god speaking god communicating and god said and then uh, in uh, verse 26, we hear the inner consulting of the Holy Trinity. When uh, God, Father, Son, Spirit said, Let us make mankind in our own image and in our own likeness. But then, by verse 27, 28, 29, the mankind that has been created has joined the conversation and the creator is discussing the meaning of human life with the very first human uh did you you and i were created to join in conversation with the father the son and the holy spirit now this isn't something new to the New Testament. This is why we were created. And sin is simply hideous, unspeakable, simply turning away from that incredible purpose and entering into a self-imposed separation to enter into a self-divorce and exiting from the with. But just a minute, mankind indeed exited from the with and man could say he is without God. Do you understand? He exits this with relationship. And so mankind in his darkness and blindness and foolishness may say of himself, herself, I am without God. But what did God do? That, that's what man did and how man perceived the results. What does God do? I know that many would say that God certainly agreed and he just let them go. They're gone, outside, finished, forgotten. Um, lost then takes on the meaning of can't find them, don't know where they are. But the scripture says that this God refused to leave you. He kept his side of the with. And so, for God so loved the world. And if you read that as it was written by John, John 3.16, it's, it's a little backwards to the way we say it in English. Because the Greeks had a way of being able to do that. They say, so loved God the world. They, they place all the emphasis, so loved. He couldn't even just say loved, so loved. So loved God the world that he gave his only begotten son, the God from God. That whoever believes on him should not perish, should not stay in lostness, but should have eternal life, Zoe, 
life of God. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. What a verse, what a verse. He doesn't back off from us. When he sees us in our darkened futility and foolishness, God doesn't faint like a Victorian woman who needs smelling salts to bring her round because she heard a curse word. No. God doesn't blink. He has determined that he shall be with you and you shall be with him. And his love marches right on into our darkness in order to achieve the intention of creation that you should be with him and that is Jesus you see isn't it wonderful that when Jesus was born quoting an ancient prophecy it says you should call his name Emmanuel have you ever noticed how that's spelled I am you've probably forgotten I said with in Hebrew is I am M well you shall call the name Jesus, you shall call him Im-an-u-el, Emmanuel. What does that mean? Im means with, El means God in Hebrew. Emmanuel means God with us. Oh, what, what, what a word that Jesus is God who has come and now joined us has taken to himself our humanity and the greeting what one could try to imagine how many times into the atmosphere of this world had been sounded the greeting the Lord be with you <laughs> I mean, we're talking trillions of times over the centuries. In fact, over the millennia had the Hebrew people greeted one another with the Lord be with you. And now the greeting, the declaration has been fulfilled. The definition has been accomplished. And God has joined us and he joined us at the root of our all our problem he entered into our darkness entered into our death only he did so with us that is he took us and said we're going through this together if you are in death and darkness then I'm coming where you are and he then smashed the power of death of Satan. He who is light flooded what was darkness. He embraced us. Having come where we are, he then rose from the dead and carried us where he is with the Father. Read Romans chapter 6. It makes it very plain that that we who have believed are realizing that when Jesus died we died and when he was buried we were buried and when he rose we rose Ephesians chapter 2 picks that up and says that we have been resurrected and if Jesus is ascended we are seated with him in heavenly places he came and joined us and said, I'm not leaving till you go with me. That's the gospel. So where he is, we are. Where we are, he is. See, Jesus at his ascension used this expression. Do you remember? He said, Lo, I am with you even unto the end of the age. But he carried it further because he said of the Holy Spirit, he said, it's better for you that I go away. That's hard for people to believe that what we have today 
is better than what the apostles experienced in the Gospels. He said to those apostles, the twelve, he said, it is better. And that's very strong language in the Greek of the New Testament. It means it is to your supreme advantage that I leave. Because unless I leave, the Holy Spirit will not come. He cannot come. But if I go away, I will send him. The Father will send him. And he said, he, the Holy Spirit, is with you. He was, the Holy Spirit was with those twelve because he was in and upon Jesus. So Jesus is saying, this one who is coming to you has been with you because he's in and upon me. And so you've got to know him through knowing me. But he said, I ascend. I am leaving. But I'm not leaving because I'm giving you the same Holy Spirit that is upon me, who has been with you, he shall be in you. And so with you has now taken its fullest definition of in you, one together, the Holy Spirit in you in that fashion. It's amazing to me, and I, I have no idea, of course, I can't see what your faces look like right now, but so many times when I have said this, or something like it to people, that they've backed off um, as if they would not truly accept the greeting, now they understood it, as if there's a certain shame, as if I'm, I'm not worthy for that, that God in his triune glory is with me, and that with is so deep that he's in me, and where he is, I am, and where I am, he is. So not only am I enjoying the fellowship of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, not only the person beloved of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, but that Father and Son and Holy Spirit is sharing my life, sharing my house, sharing my family, sharing my job where I am the awesome they are with me. And people, I say back off as if that's for some sort of spiritual elite. The first step of the gospel, you know, is to believe the gospel, the good news. And the good news is that you are the beloved of the Father, that God the Son, Lord Jesus Christ, loved you and gave himself for you, and that the Holy Spirit has been given to you and now dwells in you, and do you not know that your body is the temple or the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Now, the beginning of the Gospel is to believe that. To believe that that's the word of the God who cannot lie. That's the word of the God who said that if that is not true, then God himself would cease to be. Believe that. Or to accept your acceptance. Accept your belovedness. That's the beginning of the gospel. And then pray along with Paul's various prayers that the Holy Spirit will open the eyes of your understanding to see this the more clearly. I, I believe that 
at this this point we come to our daily and I'll call it warfare because the greatest part of what the Bible refers to as warfare it's, it's not with Satan that is certainly there but unless we recognize the real warfare is between the Holy Spirit your life who is the presence of Jesus and of the Father within you against the flesh which has been crucified but is ever a wannabe you wants you to find your identity and who you are in the flesh in your mortality in your mind in, in that non-stop flood of thoughts that arise out of the flesh the wannabe you and, and and this expression speaks directly to it and I already referred to it deliberately the Lord be with you be with you be with you immediate present tense you see the only life that you have is now and when I said now a moment ago that's history this now this is this life that bees this is it this is your life and it's in this moment at in, in the beat of your heart he is with you right where you are he's with you the flesh your mortality that wants to get back into the darkness and deny the witness of God a flesh that's already been defeated crucified yet I hear its chatter. The flesh, I say, is terrified of now. Because if ever you realize now is real, and in that real, He is with me in my innermost being to my outermost circumstances. He's with me. with you now he be with you what does the flesh try to do you uh, this I knew it's true you might never have thought about it the flesh desperately needs time past time because the flesh will forever escape this present moment by saying, if only I hadn't done, if only I had done, I wish I had, why didn't I? Or, when it would allow a thought of the Lord being with you, would remind you of a day where it was very real to you that God was with you, and you had attendant feelings of that, and so flesh says, ah, oh, yes, he was with you. That was a great day. It's a pity things aren't the same today. And then jumps into future time, which of course doesn't exist, and say, when you get your act together, when you pray more, when you read your Bible more, when you are a holy person, then the Lord will be with you. Or looking at your present circumstances, the flesh will immediately say, what if this happens? Supposing that happens or doesn't happen, what will we do? What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we put on? Will we have our house left over our head? And because we're terrified, the flesh is terrified of the present moment, we resist it. 
And it's, I don't want this. I don't want it. I, in fact, I'll even deny it's here. It's not real. It's not as bad as it seems. Or I rise up in anger at this present moment with all the circumstances it holds. Or I cower in fear before it. I turn the whole thing into some sort of dramatic performance of which I am the star. I am the victim. Poor me that this should happen to me. You know, do I have to go on? You get the drift. Rather than to recognize all of that is a lie because you are not identified by your past. I, I know that cuts a lot of people and what they believe off. You are who you are now, Christ living in you. Only then can you deal with whatever's come to you from the past. That, that happened to me, but I am not that. And therefore, because of who I am, then I can handle that in his love and in his forgiveness. And when you think about it, whatever decisions I made in the past, whatever I say foolish, maybe not. Only God can determine what decisions I made were foolish or not. But the fact is, what is, is. I can go back into my past a thousand times and never change it. It is. However we got here, it is. And as for tomorrow, it isn't. We have no idea what the next five minutes holds. This is. So, if this is all you've got, this is your life now. With all that is, the happenings of this life. What, why do we resist it? That's, that's life. We're resisting being alive. We're, we're denying, we're angry, which results in all our complaining and whining, our cursing of life, and all that hideous victim drama. No. Recognize this is the way things are. But the fact is, the Lord is with me. What I am in right now is His chosen history. He's in this with me. And even as I am here in this situation, I am with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Which means that in this situation, all the wisdom of God and the strength of God the peace of God and the joy of God and His mighty salvation is. And the more I concentrate on how much I am a victim of the, uh, the situation, the more blind I become to the fact that in Christ Jesus, who is Lord of this and all situations, I am a victor with Him. The Lord be present tense and the next moment and the next moment is 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 by the time you get to tomorrow which of course when you get to tomorrow we call it now is be but by the time we get to what in this moment we're calling tomorrow we will find the strength and the wisdom that tomorrow needs because we didn't go into the darkness of victimhood and anger and resisting of being alive. Rather, we found our life not in our circumstances, but in Jesus, who is the Lord of the circumstance. And so, we meet ourselves as we meet each other and we say the Lord be with you he be with you now in this present moment not after we have performed a thousand religious hoops 
but now, just where I is. Not whining that I should have been better so that what is shouldn't be is, which is stupid because it is, nor saying one day what I is I'll be better than, which is stupid because because you say it, you won't. It's only when you accept your is as it is and you as you is and recognize that's the is that he's with. And that's the one that he's working in to will and to do of his good pleasure and bring to pass his purposes. So, as you would greet yourself, and a fellow believer, do, do not concentrate on the happenings. How are you? How is it going? But rather gather your whole focus and attention beyond the happenings and beyond your feelings about them and beyond your flesh evaluation of them, which is always that's good and that's bad and tomorrow I've changed my mind because things changed and so that really was bad and that's really good, is it? No. Let, let your life become to yourself as well as to other believers the gospel greeting that the Lord be with you. That, you know, would cut out all complaining because complaining is a, an acceptable way of resisting being alive in this moment. It would cut out bitterness, envy, because bitterness is against people that have caused me to be in this is. Envy is looking at others and wanting to be in what we perceive to be their is instead of simply recognizing this is and he is with me in this is and get back to all those psalms that we've looked at in the past where David says over and over again the Lord is my rock my salvation my, my light my sword my buckler and all the rest of them is my shepherd Lord is my, he is in this moment and to recognize I will fear no evil for you are with me, you uh, or Psalm number three, many said, David, David wrote, many there say of me, there's no hope for him in God. I mean, he, he's past the pale, that, that's it, there's no hope for him in God. And David comes back, but thou, O Lord, art a shield around me, my glory and the lifter of my head. You is, you are, you be. That, that's it. That's all within this greeting. And so greet yourself. The when you say good night to yourself, do so. The Lord is with me. And when you awake in the morning, recognize you awake to the smile of God who couldn't wait for you to wake up to share your day and declare the Lord is with me. And if you find trouble with that, then go back to basics and in the face of Jesus Christ, accept your belovedness, accept your acceptance. Be present to him who is present to you and realize this bond of life that you are joined to him through Jesus Christ. Well, there is what I have for you tonight instead of what we announced, although we sort of almost got there, didn't we, a little bit, but there it is. And I trust that it has been a blessing to you. And so I will open up now and if we could have some time of um, yeah, that's right I did it right so if we could have any questions or discussion or testimonies 
That'll be good. Um, uh, no, Cindy's asking about the spelling. Um, the E is just a Western way of doing it. Well, when you get to many Hebrew words, we have um, we've anglicized them, and there's absolutely nothing, nothing wrong with that. We are speaking English, and therefore we Englishize them. And um, Emmanuel, sometimes within the Western culture, it's spelled Emmanuel. Nothing at all, no difference. Okay. Um, yeah, Charles, I hear all the things you said the flesh says on a daily basis, and so do we all. You are not alone. That's what the Bible means when it says the flesh is ever warring against the spirit. But the moment you recognize that, you do you understand me if I said, you know who you are. You know your identity. And my identity, I am, as I've been saying all evening, I am in Christ. Christ is in the Father. And the Holy Spirit in me and bringing me into that one relationship with Father, Son, and Spirit. That is your identity and my identity by the sheer gift of God. So when I now, if you understand that, you hear this non-stop chatter. It's, it's constant, constant. And then you realize that's not me. You see, a person who walks in the flesh finds their identity. They, they will say of that non-stop chatter going on, they say, well, that's the way I am. No, no. The moment you realize that, and the moment you realize that was crucified with Christ, that's, that's an identity. It's a wannabe me. And if I get into that filthy stream of thought, it, it, it ends in futility and darkness and round and around and around and around into despair. And 99% of victory in this area and to begin to live in the spirit, good Lord, we're back to what I said I was going to talk about, um, is to recognize I'm not that. And when all those images come from the future which do not exist, which are mere flesh horror movies, and recognize that isn't me. That's not where I'm going. I, I, where I'm going, he's going, and where he's going, I'm going, and right at this minute, I don't know what the future holds, so I'm not going to join the flesh in its expeditions into fantasy, which always end up in me being dead or the victim of some horror. Now, you recognize, see, I'm not my past. I'm not my future. I am who I am in Christ, and He in me is all I need for this now situation, which in fact will prepare me for whatever tomorrow holds. 99% of all your, your defeat in those areas is over once you realize your identity. And that's not who I am, and that's not who I am. I am who I am in Christ. I hope that helps, Charles, but please believe me, you are not alone. Uh, Russ man, is the flesh or the old man crucified? <laughs> I, we could spend a long time on that. I, I did six hours of teaching on, um, it's called In Christ. And I deal with what is the old man, what is the flesh, and so on. But let me just very quickly say that old man is not some dark side of you. Uh, the old man would be better understood as old mankind. It's the mankind that came out of Adam, of which we were all part of. And Jesus crucified that old man. He took it to himself and that old man was crucified. 
Uh, and so that's the end of that. So when people say, well, that was my old man, as if he's some werewolf rising, uh, gray, no, no, don't be daft. If, if the scripture says you, the old you was crucified with Christ, that's the end of it. End of it. No more discussion. And, and as I say, the flesh is living from my senses, living from my human mind, living from my humanity living from my humanity as if there was no God as if there was no redemption as if Christ didn't live in me because I'm sure Charles would tell you along with me telling you that all those what-ifs and all of those what-ifs they they all assume that God isn't the God the Bible says if if he's there at all you notice that every time you're anxious you never include God in those thoughts have you noticed that it's all assuming God didn't keep his word left you in the lurch that, that's that's the flesh and, and so yes um, Romans 6 makes it very plain that your entire connection with the race of that came out of Adam was crucified with Christ you are a new creation, and the beginning of that creation was Jesus, who is called the last Adam. He's the beginning of a new mankind, a new man, as often referred to in Scripture. So, as I say, that, there's six hours of teaching around what all that means, but that's bottom line, okay? Um, freedom walking. This kills anxiety at the root. Right on, sure does. Anxiety is the emotion of being alone in your inability. I like that. You might hear that on a CD one day. I'll steal it from you. That, that's, that's a good phrase. Anxiety is the emotion of being alone in your inability. And right there, you see, that denies the entire gospel that has said he is with you and will never leave you and he is your strength and your wisdom and I will never leave you, I will never forsake you and so on. So you see, anxiety springs out of the lies which the flesh will automatically gravitate to. Um, Lexi, I have problems um, because of my past. My flesh wants to blame the past for my problems. If I accept... Hmm, I don't quite understand uh, the sentence, but the fact is, Lexi, what, what I'm trying to say, what is, is. I can go back and play the blame game that if I had done this and not that, if that person had never been in my life, then I would be, and you could go on, you could spend as much time as you've spent living up to this moment, you could spend as much time going over that past to blame it for everything that you call wrong. The fact is, I am speaking to you exactly as I am tonight, where I am, because of everything in the past, including what we might call good, what we might call bad. Um, and because of where you come from in the past, you're listening to me and watching me. Um, and if other decisions had been made by both of us, maybe this wouldn't even be happening. The fact is, the past is the complexity of the past. And the amazing fact is, God loved me out of that past into life and used that past to make me who I am today. There's a verse in the Psalms where David said, You put all my tears in your bottle. That is, he looks back in his past and it was like a, a veil of tears. And he says, You take all the tears of my life and you put them in your bottle now this is interesting the word bottle there in the Hebrew language is wine making bottle that is when the um, Hebrews made wine they had special bottles to put 
the grape juice in to turn it into wine. And, and there was a special word for that. And David uses that. He said, you put all my tears in your wine making bottle. That is all that makes me weep of the past, all the tears of my life over what I did, over what has happened to me. He says, you, you catch those tears and you put them in your winemaking bottle. What happens? My tears turn into fresh new wine. And, and, and he uses everything that happened in my past to bring about his redemption in me now. He redeems my past. He forgives my sin and redeems my mistakes. When I, aeons ago, when I lived in New York, I, I was a, a gardener, organic gardener, and I had a great big compost heap. And if you don't know what that is, it means all the stuff in the kitchen that, that is an embarrassment, that is uh, dead fish and vegetables and bits of old, anything that's going to rot um, and stink up the kitchen. Well, I took that and I put it into my compost heap and the, the wonder of a compost heap, it turns all of that into the best soil of the garden. Well, that, that's our God. He takes our past and, and He redeems it. He puts it in the compost heap of grace and, and makes it into the very best soil of life so that you and I, we, we look at our mistakes and it's there we discover the love of God and out of that we become strong. And, and so um, I, I would say this very carefully because, um, you know, without being eyeball to eyeball with you and talking. Uh, I hate to make general statements, but many of our problems in life are not because of something we did in the past. A, it's because we didn't receive or don't believe that He forgives us the past, which means totally released and it's gone. But also, and more importantly, we have a problem because we identify with it. We say, that's, that's me instead of realizing me is in this present moment. And you see, my past isn't in this present moment. It's the Holy Trinity who is in this present moment. And, and that's why I can lift my head and go boldly on knowing that He is my life and all that I need. I, 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 hope, I hope that helps, Lexi, and everybody else. Um, Well, Zimka is, is asking, what do I do when I live with the lost who constantly remind and define me by my past? I, I, again, that's, it, it depends a lot on the context of what you're saying and who they are and when they say it and how they say it. But the fact is, um, I personally, over the years, have had need to simply um, refuse what other people say about me. And um, when in some cases I will have to correct people and say, um, because of the grace of God, this is who I am and that's who I was. If that's not applicable, then I have to say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And I mean that. They don't know what they're saying. They're speaking out of their darkness. And to affirm the truth of who I am. Um, and also, and this is another whole subject, but this is why believers get together. Um, if you read the scriptures in the New Testament, which uh, not only encourage, but they urge, it, it, it borders on, commands us to come together with believers. Um, and, and in coming together, it says, you exhort and you encourage one another. So I need, incidentally, this is one big reason why we are coming together down in San Antonio on Thursday uh, for such a group where 
we can encourage one another. I need someone to remind me. That's why this phrase was a greeting. You were reminded a hundred times a day by other people saying, the Lord be with you. I need that. I need that. You certainly do in the light of your question. And so I need to be with other believers who in some way or another, or simply being with them, the Holy Spirit will achieve it, that I am reminded in the biblical sense, I am placed in the middle of this reality. And um, I would certainly ask the Holy Spirit to lead me to such believers that I can remind them of who they are and they can remind me of who I am and then walk in the midst of others who know not what they say or do and quietly remind myself of who I am in Christ. Um, Jeffrey, which version of the Bible do you recommend that we read? That's a multi-answer, Jeffrey. I, I read the New American Standard. I love the New King James. And I carry an Amplified Bible with me most of the time. And also, when I want to relax and read, I read the message, which is not a version, but a paraphrase. So, somewhere in there, I do not like the New International Version. They've got many um, mistranslations, I believe. And so it goes. So, but that, that's a simple, basic answer. Beth, how do you walk in your isness when you are in physical pain. Um, I think everything I've said tonight applies to some kind of pain. You see, there's physical pain, but then there is emotional pain based on what may be happening to me. There's mental pain as I try, if, if I wanted to go that route, I, I, I try to figure out what's happening and how to get out of this. A and then the mental pain of why did this happen to me? Um, there, there's pain that's brought, like we, we just shared, um, pain that comes from other people. And so physical pain falls in with all those that I come to realize who am I and I, I've said it in all these other areas so I'll now include physical that I am not my physical pain I may have it but I am not it um, so, so many people, they, and, and now you may think I, I'm getting very far out and very picky, but just if you think that, then forgive me and listen to what I'm saying anyway. That I, I, I hear people who, who would come to us for prayer and they say, I am a diabetic. Well, really, before we can truly help them, we have to move them to their true identity. You am not a diabetic. You have it, but you am not it. Your amness, your isness, is Christ in you, and He is your life. And to transcend your pain and to walk in health, uh, arises from who you are, Christ in you. I remember, and I might have told this story before, but when I was a pastor in Ireland, and that was hundreds of years ago, um, and there was a, a dear lady, older lady, and she was ridden with pain, and, and really, according to the doctors, she couldn't walk. But on this subject that we're talking about, which in those days I knew very little. Um, I was very young, 
and I was in the learning process. And those old believers in Ireland, they taught me quite a bit in terms of how they practically live this life. And whenever I went to visit this old lady, she was always down in the kitchen. And I had been assured that the doctor said she couldn't walk. And she told me when I questioned her, she said, I, I managed to get one foot out of my bed in the morning. And, and I say that this foot is filled with the presence of Jesus and life. And so this foot is going on the floor. And then she gets her leg out and she says her leg is filled with the presence of the Lord Jesus and so on and, and by the time she's got her body out she has realized her true identity and that identity enabled her to walk and she would and this I'm going back I mean before lots of things today but she she would get the vegetables and she would uh, prepare the vegetables and peel the potatoes and do it all I mean deliberately, intentionally receiving the life, who was her true identity in life. I don't know if that helps. I'm in no way disregarding your pain. Um, any more than I disregard the pain of having people from the darkness who tell you who you're not. And, and uh, the pain of being in certain, the pain of people who may be indeed on this webinar, who on the East Coast, uh, sitting in floodwaters and darkness without light and so on. That's pain of a different kind. But we always come back to this. That's not my identity, who I am in Christ. That's it. And I trust that helps. Katie, you made the statement that God is with me in his chosen... Um, just a minute. I don't think I said those words, Katie. In his chosen history for me, no, I said that he is in your life where you are. I didn't say he had chosen this for you. I said he has joined you in your history where you are. And I don't know where you're going yet, but that makes a big difference. If this is his chosen history, that's a sort of fatalism which means that I do not choose, but rather I'm a puppet on some sort of divine string. Uh, I don't believe that. Um, exactly. I, you, I'm sorry, Katie, you misunderstood me there. The rest of your question, I think I've answered it. No, th this is not uh, his chosen history. That is not a biblical term at all. It was invented by a certain section of the Christian faith and um, to me it is fatalism if if this is a cho his chosen history for me then as you have asked in the question I have no choice and really what we're doing right now is quite meaningless because it was all predetermined and we're like puppets on strings and no so your question if I had said that would be correct question but I didn't say it and so you're right in, in what you think Katie okay Andrew Colony well I think it's Andrew um, prayer before you call I will answer he is with us in our need he is with us in our desiring and asking he is with us to ensure that we have what we ask so the father will be glorified amen that's a very important thing that I didn't have time to get to. But seeing as you brought it up, Andrew, um, in Romans 8, Paul joins with us, which I'm very comforted by, and he says, we, no, he didn't say you, he says, we do not know how to pray as we ought. That's a very comforting thing that Paul could say that, uh, as, as well as I, I know that too. But he goes on to say, but the Holy Spirit helps our infirmities. And, and so he prays with us and for us. Um, our prayers are joined in with the Holy Spirit. 
he is called in that verse the helper of our prayers. And the interesting thing is the word help there was used of, <clears throat> if we've got to move the desk at which I'm sitting, I would say you take that end, I'll take this end, and we move it as one man, although really we're one at each end. And um, so you helped me, you took the other end. And the word there in the Greek is that. So the Holy Spirit joins us and becomes our prayer partner or is with us in our prayer. And we pray in tandem with the Spirit. It's right on, Andrew, right on. Glad it helps, Carol. Um, Cindy, don't we waste our thought life on what we have done, plan on doing, what has and is happening to us, and that we are totally miss the truth of who we really are. That's basically what I just said, absolutely. Um, the moment you go back into that ceaseless stream of chatter of my past, and you know, you, 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 I'm sure all of you know who I'm talking about, the people I'm talking about. Uh, they're drama queens, you know? I mean, you never meet them without... They're, they're, they're in the middle of some tragedy, and they're always the victim. And then when they talk about their past, it's the same. And oh, No, what, what a total waste of time. Total. In fact, it's futility. And the, more, the, the moment you get off into those two extensions of time, which are, they, they're not is, then it, you're there and there and not here. And it's here where the Holy Spirit is. Here is where you're filled with the Spirit. Here, now. And of course, really and truly, that's legalism, you see. Legalism always goes in the flesh mode that says, if you hadn't have done this, you wouldn't be here. And if you will do that, then God will bless you. But right now, nothing's happening. Except you're miserable because you're sort of separated from God. But um, you, you, you've got to... And of course, there are some dear people today, and they I, I, if you've never met them, this sounds crazy, but they've gone back a thousand generations to try and confess all the sins of their ancestors and get cut off from all their curses. Oh, for goodness sake. I thought going back 60 years was bad enough, but um, no, no, is now. You are in Christ. And if there's anything to be dealt with in the past, and sometimes there is in terms of forgiveness, in terms of, of realizing um, who I am now then changes how I look at the past. But that's the Holy Spirit's business. He's in charge of the archives of your life, and we don't waste time trying to dig it up. So, but yes. Um, Claude, I think much of our problem is the leaven of the Pharisees. As you have taught in modern times, it's the ladder theology, yeah. Ladder theology is you're climbing the ladder to try and get to God and you're, you're, you're doing this and then that's not quite enough, you do that and do this and uh, actually ladder theology uh, was a real theology back in, oy, when was it, maybe 6th, 7th, 8th century, I might be a little early there, but yeah, they really did believe it was a ladder and you were climbing the ladder closer and closer to God and all the time he's with you. We don't have to climb up a ladder. He always, he's already come down the ladder to us. And yeah, that is the leaven of the Pharisees. It works in us. It's poison. Um, in order for this message to get through, the Holy Spirit must open the door to your heart for Jesus to come in and all his, this teaching will become real in your everyday walk in Christ. Um, I would agree, uh, and I'm, I'm sure this is, is the heart of what you're saying, so I'm not disagreeing with you, but um, the fact is the Holy Spirit dwells in you, believer. He does. And 
what we need is the realization we need to have our eyes open to see that he is within us and he is now working in us Philippians 2 12 13 he is now working in us to will and to do of his good pleasure um, and so um, I, I, I would say I'm just to open the door to your heart for Jesus to come in that, that's the phrase and, and I'm saying he's in in the Holy Spirit he's in what we need to do is to know that he's in and it's when we yield to the Holy Spirit by saying open my blind eyes to see that you're here in me and I'm in you and so that that's how I'd comment on that um, Lord of the circumstances is this a reference to the sovereignty of God well sort of um, the the um, I mean he God is sovereign the what I would say when I you might hear a hesitation in the light of what we just had a question I would say that in his sovereignty he has placed us into history to make our choices and so the fact I'm choosing to do what I'm doing and it's a real valid authentic choice is because in his sovereignty he chose that's how we would be um, but Jesus is Lord of the circumstances in that when he rose from the dead and ascended it says at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess he is Lord and he said himself uh, at his ascension all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth present tense here now so when I say Lord of the circumstance I mean um, and I say this simple and factual that Jesus is Lord is actually if you really want to push it it's a political statement it means that Jesus is the true Lord over the USA and not a president or a party that Jesus Christ is Lord uh, and he's Lord over Europe and Lord over the Middle East and so on and that's a big statement but to me he's Lord of circumstances and he's Lord over all who might be part of our circumstances today and so that's what I meant by that and um, yeah it is I mean Jesus Christ is sovereign Lord I just had to make sure you understood what I mean by sovereign okay Mark Stephen um, throwing my feet off the side of the bed in the morning I say Maranatha Holy Spirit Amen I know the Trinity lives in me but I go out of my way to say come with me that's a good point we know he does yet we still live in the with it's the whole meaning of prayer you can only pray for what you've already got I've said that many times before um, we have all things in Christ but it is so set that this is relationship not puppetry and so he doesn't just dump his blessings on us he says come and let's talk about this come let us reason together and so ask of me for what I've already said that I would give you and so that that's it okay Carol I've been working on getting rid of negative thought patterns this explains how to do that better and also what is behind those thoughts thanks yeah there's that that's that's true if you've understood what I've said your identity is the ultimate and eternal positive one and he wills your blessing okay I'm afraid I have to stop we've gone over our allotted time and um, so I need to now bless you and say the Lord be with you everyone the Lord the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit bless you 
everyone in every step you take and every place you go and every word you speak. So I declare you blessed. And that's the way it is. Amen. And I shall see you all next week. And if you're in the San Antonio area, I trust I'll see you on Thursday night at 7 o'clock. All is on our website. So, blessings on you.